you know, I think there's definitely a, a reputation of rural Americans for being really narrow-minded, um, stuck in their ways. But I think there's just that idea that, you know, it's all conservative people that just think a certain way and we're not, not as intelligent as people who live in a city maybe or not as worldly. My name is Betsy Roeder and I am the executive director of the Cultural Center in New York Mills. Does it ever surprise people to hear that there's a contest like this in a town of 1,200 people? Always, yeah. Yeah, I get a lot of that. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't believe that's happening in your tiny town. The way that it started, this idea of civil discourse and a philosophy competition for everyday Americans, that's, those were the original intentions of the Think Off and they remain true to how we run the Think Off today. So really not a whole lot has changed. The Great American Think Off is a philosophy competition and it's really for the everyday American. So the idea of the Think Off was to bring philosophy out of the ivory towers of academia and into the lives of everyday Americans. So I mean we certainly, you know, we get decent amount of essays every year, typically at least a couple of hundred. Where do the essays come from? Mostly. People from a wide variety of, of geographic backgrounds and also from a variety of occupations, ages. I mean, really, every year it ranges from, you know, 16-year-old high school students to 90-year-old retired whatever. You know, we have farmers, truck drivers, people. We've had several people who've been incarcerated enter the contest. We've had actually one year somebody who was in jail one was a finalist and they first were going to be able to get out for the debate and then they were like no actually we can't let them out so every year um, the, there's a committee of volunteers that get together and discuss ideas for the question and once a question is selected that is announced each year on january 1st then people have until april 1st to write essays answering the question they are directed to choose a side one way or the other and then write an essay of 750 words or less and so that comes to us by april 1st and then we take a month um, for the committee to review and judge those essays and then we announce the four finalists on may 1st and then the debate happens each year on the second saturday in june so the audience does the voting. The purpose is for them to listen to these debaters and make a vote for who argued their point best. The first year we asked the question, uh, the nature of humankind inherently good or inherently evil? And believe it or not, that actually ended in a tie vote. So the question was not answered until our 20th Great American Think Off, we asked the question again. Evil won, actually, which is a little bit depressing. Everybody has opinions on these big questions in life. And so we want to give people the chance to write an essay with those opinions and thoughts and experiences and come to New York Mills and debate that topic live each year. Well, would you look at that? That, well, that sure is different. Hmm. Well, well, I don't, I don't oh, sure, sure. They're about to start. Number one, I'd say the number one thing is that the writer has to take a definite, firm side. A wishy-washy essay doesn't go anyplace. The writer has to actually take a firm side. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is, is that we do like to have essayists include personal experience. Um, you know, actually base their argument on personal experience and observation, um, you know just a purely philosophical um, essay might not cut it just because we want to make the event more personal. The idea is to get, you know, the common man and woman to respond to our, our solicitation for essays. We, yeah, we don't discourage philosophers, mind you, but um, we're definitely looking for just people in ordinary life to write. What does it take to change someone's mind? <laughs> A really good argument. Well, <laughs> oh, I never thought of it that way, but have you ever thought? I don't, I don't know. It's a good thing to consider. I... And the 2018 Great American Think Off question is, which plays a larger role in shaping one's life, success or failure? Now, let's go meet our contestants. 
I'm Anthony Berryhill. I'm 35 years old. I live in Austin, Texas, but I'm originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. I work at GLG, which is a company that works with investment firms that are doing research. So I work to create all of our corporate trainings for people who are just out of college to when they become managers. I actually came to debating because my high school, they required speech and debate as a mandatory class for all students. And my debate coach after a practice debate said to me that I needed to try for the team. And after I said no eight times, talking about eight times of failure, he finally convinced me to do a practice and actually do my first debate tournament at a national qualifying varsity tournament. And you still debate? Right? Oh, no. <laughs> I, I've coached debaters. There's no opportunities for people or adults to debate. There's debate in college, but it's not nearly as rigorous as in high school. And even if even at the end of college, the only, there's maybe like a Toastmasters, which is like a speech competition, but there's no one-on-one, -on -one evidence-heavy, research-heavy, philosophical debate. And to be honest, like philosophical debate pretty much ends af at the end of your high school career. I mean, my background was a very tough background. So I lived in the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans, super high, you know, super high prison rates, very low dropout rates, and just very difficult for people in general, especially for urban black males. And because of that background, that informed a lot of the way I think about the world, but it's also, I teach a lot of students of color as well. So for them, they see debate as an opportunity to actually have advocacy to talk about issues they care about that are relevant to the debate topics we do. So with them, I do a lot of work to help them with their confidence because they often have teachers who, you know, through their high schools, even through debate, may, may crush that confidence based on various factors. That's part of it. But also, you know, in, in the style of debates I teach is you have, to, you have to learn how to debate things from both sides of the political spectrum. So a lot of my style is in terms of teaching them how to find something they actually care about and agree with and to do it very well, versus trying to turn them into something they're not, or to sound or, so, or look like someone they're not. Um, didn't have any sneakers when I was um, at home in, in, in New Orleans because I, you know, I had a very poor family. <laughs> they couldn't afford it. So as I did more and more work and did all that other stuff, I was able to kind of fulfill that hobby. What's your, like, what's your niche? What's your sneaker niche? <laughs> niche? Things that are very flashy. So, like, or I have orange sneakers here, gold sneakers here, so anything that stands out. And I think that's actually a debate relevant point, which is before debate, I was very scared of being seen. And this is just one manifestation of it. I learned how to be in an audience full of 200 people or 500 people, whereas nothing in my background or in school taught me to do that. My name is Rudy San Miguel. I am 43. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I am a manager at a coffee shop. I've not done a lot of debating. Uh, as I told you, I'm not an incredibly um, competitive person, so I will probably be voted out in the first round. Dixie, come here. Come here. This is Dixie. <laughs> you live in New Orleans but have you spent time in small towns before? I have. I was uh, born and raised in a little town called Penfield, Illinois, a uh, population about 150. My father was the only brown skin person in town. I inherited my mother's Irish white skin uh, and my father's black hair. But he raised me, they raised me in a small white town. Um, and then being gay, uh, at the time I didn't know what it meant. We were that sheltered that I didn't even, I wasn't aware of what gay was until high school. Uh, when, and I was outed in high school. So that's when I discovered at the same time that I was gay, what gay was. Um, I, you know, I knew I was different, but, um, so the, the combination of the two could be difficult. There were people in the town who were racist and would say things to me about my dad or about me. Um, but yeah, the, the, the race thing didn't play as big a part of my life as the gay thing did. Yeah. I'd always been a writer since I was a child. I'd always been writing, regardless of what path my career and life took me. I'd always been a writer. Quite frankly, I entered this because my wonderful partner uh, is trying to get me to stop doing a thousand jobs and focus on writing. And so I thought I would do that. And I got online and began researching um, ways to, to, to earn money writing and to uh, sort of flesh out my resume as a writer, and this was something I came across. 
uh, and it seemed like it would be exciting and interesting, and the question was perfect for the place I'm at in my life. So it, it fit very well. My name is Tanya Obari. I am 36 years young. I am originally from Baltimore, Maryland, but currently reside in Nashville, Tennessee. My career is a freelance editor, writer, educator, and full-time mom. My daughter's name is Talani. Uh, she's three years old. Um, she's very tall, so <laughs> a lot of people mistake her for five or six, but she's the light of our world. My husband and daughter will be joining me at this year's Think Off. <laughs> we went back and forth about whether to bring her or not. We weighed the pros and cons, and I realized that she needs to be there because her seeing mom on stage, um, seeing mom speak about a topic that's relevant and just important, that's gonna shape her idea of what it is to, to be a woman, what it is to be on stage, what it is to think. I'm a first generation college graduate. And so I didn't have maybe the examples that um, I, I wanted and that I felt like I needed at the time. And I just want my daughter to have a good example for me. My favorite authors now, Tayari Jones, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, um, Chimamanda. So I can go on and on. Um, mostly I do, I do look to other black female writers um, because it's important for me as a black woman to, to just to hear their point of view and their perspective and to be able to add to the circle of that as well. Are you apprehensive? at all about coming to New York Mills? Yes, I am. I'm very apprehensive. Um, if I could be candid, I am nervous about the culture and setup of the city. Um, I have only lived in big cities in my entire life, and I've never spent significant time in a rural area. So this will be a first time for me, and I'm excited. I'm anticipating the trip. Um, so that I can put all of my knowledge that I've learned on paper um, <laughs> to practice and also to see how New York Mills reflects a little bit of Tanya Abari. My name is Mark Blant. I live in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm 69 years old, and I am a retired German teacher from the Virginia Beach schools. I was a total of about 40 years of teaching. I'm a retired instructor for Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, where I taught humanity courses, mostly courses on values and ethics, and courses on Western civilization and English and Introduction to Psychology courses as well. What's interesting about the Great American Think Off is you can, in most cases, take both sides. I belong to the Virginia Beach Writers Group, and one of the things that we do is we try to, to enter tournaments or writing contests. I usually write an essay on, on both sides, and then I'll present it to the writers group and, and decide which one they like the best, which one they think would, would be the best for the contest. And uh, I usually go with that one. Uh, well, I'll tell you what I like about it more than anything else is that you never stop learning chess. Never. You could play chess for the rest of your life and you still learn something. Even if you're the world champion, it, it's the same thing. And what do you so, like about that? Uh, I guess because it's a challenge, and 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 you and you could because you cannot ever master it totally. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's the idea that I want to master it totally, <laughs> and you know it, even though you know you can't. When you play young people, they're more likely to be impulsive, and in fact, a lot of times you can simply sit back, wait for the young person to make an impulsive move, 
They make an impulsive move and, and, and that's it, the game's over. Life is, uh, becomes a lot like a chess game. In the early part of your life, you're still struggling. You're trying to get somewhere. You're trying to make a plan. You don't have it yet. It hadn't come to you yet. In the middle part of your life, let's say uh, from 30 to 45, you have a plan. You know what you want to do with your life, but you're not there yet. And in the latter part of your life, of course, you're searching for your final answers. Your end game will come. Everybody understands mortality a whole lot better when they're 70 years old than when they are when they're 18. And what did you argue? I argued success. And I argued success because... <laughs> My side is failure. I believe that failure shapes one's life more than success. I argued that success defines and shapes who you are more than failure. My position is that failure does a better job of shaping one's life than success. Your speed. Sound. Speed. Sound. Great American Think Off. Scene one. Take three. Action. The Cultural Center was founded by John Davis in 1990. Our legal name is actually the New York Mills Arts Retreat because we started as an artist residency program. So John moved here from the Twin Cities and bought a kind of rundown farm and ran the residency out of his farmhouse and his barn for the first couple of years. My dream, what I really wanted to do was to do my art on my own place out in the country with a little barn as a studio but I pretty much was looking for uh, something in my price range. That was the, uh, the first factor involved. Drove up here one day and looked at the place and knew that was the right place and bought it the next day. I, I mean, I knew it was just New York Mills. I mean, it has such a nice ring to it. It's like perfect for an arts, you know, I mean, it's like, ah, that's it. So I really didn't even have to look at this place. Uh, the realtor said that there was uh, an abandoned house on it and, you know, a couple of barns and it sounded great to me. You know, when he was showing it to me, I think he thought I was crazy. It was to the point where another three years, um, nobody could have done anything with it. And I think the people around here thought it, it had already reached that point, but I could picture how it could look. This building that we're in now um, was actually going to be demolished. It was built in 1885, it was a general store, and then in the late 1980s was a furniture store, and then the furniture store closed, and so they were gonna knock the building down. And John Davis said, please don't knock that cool building down. Um, if you give me some money to rehab it, I'll turn it into an art center.
and let's join our contestants as they present their arguments in the high school auditorium. Moderating this year's Think Off is Ashley Hansen. <laughs> Round one, arguing success is Mark versus Rudy. All right, let's do it. If you fall off the horse or bicycle, you get back on it. Do that enough times and you become proficient at the task of riding. You started with failure and ended with success, but which played a larger role in shaping your life? My first memorable experience with success came in high school when I realized I could outrun any student in my class. What gave me pleasure was winning the 800 meter for the city. The losses no longer mattered. Success kept me running. Had I settled for failure, I would have never made it back to the starting line. One year after graduation, I found myself in the Army in Stuttgart, Germany. I was put in a slaughterhouse where I did meat inspections for the military. Not one person in the slaughterhouse spoke English, and I didn't speak a word of German. The days became long and lonely, and the work more difficult without the ability to communicate. Every evening, I learned 10 phrases that I could use the next day. Within three months, I communicated effectively in the language. I could say anything I wanted. I could read fairly well. And over a beer and brat verse, I could understand the lunch jokes. Because of my success with German, by month four as a PFC, I was selected to be the chauffeur for the commanding officer of our unit. After returning to the States, I attended Old Dominion University, where I earned my first degree, a BA in German. Forty years later, I retired as a high school and middle school German teacher from the Virginia Beach schools. My success in German had shaped my entire career. Failure was nowhere in sight. Before I began my teaching career, however, I went through a 10-year period of constant failure. I worked as a truck driver, a salesman, bowling lanes technician, waiter, chauffeur, clerk, truck loader, carpenter, lifeguard, gas station attendant, mechanic, steel supervisor, handyman, trapper, crab boat captain, and furniture deliverer. None of these jobs provided enough income to support a family. Failure had kept me company all the way. By the time I was offered my first teaching position, I was six months behind in my trailer park rent. I was driving a car I bought for $200. My trailer was in desperate need of repair. We didn't even have an operative furnace. And we were one payment away from losing our trailer. The Christmas of that year, I bought my wife a pair of underwear, my daughter a pair of socks, and my son a toy truck. I chopped down our Christmas tree in the woods, and we spent the holiday without heat. I do know the meaning of failure, and I understand its devastation, but I didn't let it shape my life. During my years as a teacher, I also fell in love with chess. Here, success was slower in the making. Mr. Failure shook my hand over and over. Bobby Fisher stated that, that you have to lose a thousand games before you begin to get better. Well, I lost my thousand games, but today I have 64 trophies, several thousand dollars in prize money, 23 trips to the World Open, and chess six days a week. Mr. Failure only rides in my back seat and bothers me once in a while. Success sits beside me in the front and keeps me company. Thank you, Mark. We will now hear Rudy's essay.
The automatic doors at Winn-Dixie shuddered open as I tightened my grip on the plastic bag full of coins. A frail man with watery eyes and a hello, I'm Roger name badge pointed me toward a machine that would take my change and turn it into roughly 85% its value in cash. At 41, I possess two master's degrees, $12 in my bank account, and this bag, which I'd hoped would be enough for a loaf of bread, some peanut butter, and at least half a tank of gas. As I poured the change into the bowels of the hunkering machine, I thought of a favorite quote from Mary Pickford in which she assured us that each day is a new chance for success. The quote ends, this thing we call failure is not the falling down, but the staying down. Despite being virtually unable to secure a job in any field remotely related to any degree I've earned, I've managed to squeak by on meager tips from miserable food service jobs and hobble out some semblance of a life with the additional assistance of good friends and family, a patient partner, and great beer. For more than two decades, I've been floating in endless choppy waters that will one day drown me. But I hold on, waiting for the right ship to pass. As Pickford suggests, I get up. As a dreamer and someone who firmly holds that everything must happen for a reason, I believe all experiences we have in a day are successes, even negative ones, uh, for they shape us and determine our next step. As a child, when I would fail at something, my father would always ask, did you learn anything? We are shaped by all of these successes, regardless of whether we arrive at the change machine and are given more money than we had hoped for, or the bag filled with coins splits open and all the coins fall down the drain. In the end, the success is in getting more money or learning to use a stronger bag next time. What then is failure? I'm reminded of another quote that goes something like, God never gives you more than you can handle unless you die of something. <laughs> success is getting out of bed this morning and finding moments in life that will give us the strength to get out of bed tomorrow morning. Success isn't always tangible and can't be quantified. Instead, it's like matter existing all around us. When there is no more success to be had, we stop getting up. I believe failure is that moment when our successes become too few and inconsequential that we, as Pickford suggests, stop giving, getting up. Failure is, quite frankly, death. How death greets us can be at our own hands, at the hands of another, or most likely by the hands of time, nature, or for some, a higher power giving us more than we can handle. Failure does not exist outside of death, therefore we can't be shaped by it. It is our successes, our every experience, and our reaction to those experiences that determine who we are and how we interact with others and the world around us. Our successes determine if we get back up. Failure is never getting up again. And now we're back with round two, the failure bracket. Tanya versus Anthony. If I never failed at things I once wanted to achieve, I know I would be the most unhappy person in the world. I've been a personal failure many times. Harvard has rejected me three different times for college admission. McKinsey put the rejected stamp on my application when I applied for a job. And the number of failures at getting a date is nearing the thousands. <laughs> but in all of those cases, failure truly tested my desire for what I thought I wanted out of life. I applied to Harvard because my dad told me that it has the best brand name. I blindly filled out the college application form with little thought about the culture, curriculum, student life, and most of all, the weather. I applied to McKinsey because I was told in graduate school that it was the best place to work. But I didn't factor in the long hours, the drain of travel, or if I'd actually enjoy doing Excel 70 to 100 hours a week. And finally, I can't count on the number of times I've asked a woman out on a date based strictly based on her looks or my guy friends' peer pressure. In retrospect, the failure of scoring a date has saved me a lot of heartache, drama, and mutual dissatisfaction. The larger point is not about my personal and professional tastes, but instead to emphasize how failure sharpens our decision-making and emotional swords. It is easy to go for things and pray for success based on peer pressure and groupthink. As a teacher of high school debaters, I see this year in, year out. Students are told what to value, love, and strive for by their peers and their parents. But when I ask them why they want these things, 
the common answer is some version of, because I want to be the best. Everyone else says I need to do it, but little true desire. Edison famously viewed his thousands of failures at creating a functional light bulb as part of his education. Einstein was able to reject and failure in school because he was an out-of-the-box thinker. And finally, if you look at the backgrounds of any of the sharks on Shark Tank, their roads to multi-millions were no picnic either. But in all of these and other examples, failure, when viewed with the proper perspective, shapes one's life by building character and steering one toward more fruitful and important directions. Success is dangerous. It can create an illusion of invincibility. Crises can occur when success is knocking at your door because you don't know or you are already blissfully unaware that a big problem is brewing. Governments are especially vulnerable. As a Katrina survivor, I saw the pictures of my previous family home after it got hit with about 20 feet of water. I still think about my city and the neighbors who spent decades riding out storms and successfully doing so. Many, unfortunately, didn't live to survive the correction to their hubris. Success enables one to ignore the possibility of failure or catastrophe. It inspires ideas like momentum and inevitability in sports and professional competition. Groupthink then kicks into overdrive, shutting out any naysayers who warn that the successful may have metaphorically have no clothes on. Just ask the 72-win Golden State Warriors and all of those sports journalists who said it was impossible for the team to lose. <laughs> Failure shapes life on both ends. It gives us feedback on the decisions we make, and if we let it, it can warn us before we completely go off course. In my own life, Failure and rejection saved me from the bitter cold of Cambridge, 100-hour work weeks, and hundreds of miserable dates. <laughs> Thank God for failure. <laughs> there are no secrets to success. It is the result of preparation, hard work, and learning from failure. Colin Powell. As clear as the midday sky, the first time that I experienced failure is a vivid photograph perched upon the back corner of my earliest childhood memories. At six years old, failure wasn't a feeling or a topic that I had already explicitly encountered, yet it suddenly landed on my shoulder during the first round of the State Dramatic Reading Championship. Conquering the rounds locally, I was surely a shoe-in to take the state title. After many weeks of diligently preparing a short dramatic reading of Shel Silverstein's Listen to the Mustn'ts, the words were so fitting that I really believed that anything could be. The odds were already stacked against me before I took the stage. The lone representative from a school district that wasn't on anyone's radar, the lone person of color, the lone contestant whose parents couldn't afford a fancy competition dress or sparkly new shoes, the lone contestant who read in a distinct Baltimore vernacular. Somehow though, I was confident in my ability to beat those odds. The performance was powerful. It was my best one to date. I read with passion, clarity, and a particular emphasis on the last line of the poem. Anything can be. I believed it. I stood there and I had a two minute pause until the first place winner was announced. All of which the time was spent with my voices in my head, arguing the competition's outcome. So when the winner was announced, I intentionally blocked the sound and I saw an ecstatic girl sprinting towards the podium to claim the championship trophy. In that moment, I felt a single tear run down my face. As the eliminated contestants exited the stage, one of the judges whispered something to those who had not been named winners. Remember, failure is simply success turned inside out. I expect to see you all next year. Suddenly, those tears transformed into hope. Did I win the state title? No. Did this mean that I was a horrible reader? No. 
Was I going to try again? Well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> this was a tough lesson to learn so early, but a necessary one. The next year, I practiced harder, returned to the state championship, and received second place. The next year, I practiced even harder, and then I danced to the winner's circle to pick up my first place trophy. Failure had created an insatiable desire to do better. In the 30 years post learning the first memorable lesson, failure has since shown up to my doorstep more times than I can count. Both microscopic missteps and colossal failures that have cost employment, savings, residencies, and security. There were many times when failure, especially the extensive ones, made me uncomfortable. At times, failure's villainous stare discouraged me from believing that I was even capable of success. Our society glorifies success, which doesn't allow us to see others' failures, even if they are the catalyst behind our winning. All of these factors can make one believe that failure can only negatively shape your life. However, reality is that failure is a vital stepping stone to success. When I poured my life savings into a business that failed, I may have lost the LLC, but I gained valuable experience about how to be an entrepreneur. When I moved hundreds of miles away to pursue a job that eventually laid me off, instead of focusing on being let go, I appreciated the beauty of navigating places outside of my comfort zone. When doctors warned me that obesity and hypothyroidism was causing infertility, I became resilient and relentless in my pursuit of natural healing and fertility. This time, the perceived failure resulted in a beautiful baby girl who's sitting in the audience right there. <laughs> Failure humbles the spirit in unimaginable ways, allowing humans to find strength, to persist, and to conquer. While life's road of success is still unfolding for me, I am reminded by that great lesson I learned three decades ago. Each failure is a lesson. It's not a punishment. It is success turned inside out, and my life is infinitely better because of it. Thank you. Holy cow, audience. This is a tough one here. Once you have cast your votes, we are going to take a brief intermission while the judges tally the votes. Stretch your legs, shake out your bodies, meet a new neighbor, and we'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Thank you all. Arguing on the side of success, please give a round of applause to our winner, Mark Bland. And arguing on the side of failure, please give a round of applause to our winner, Anthony Berryhill. And the final round is here, folks. Mark versus Anthony. Success versus failure. And you know, this round is interesting because the audience gets to submit questions to the thinkers. That's what they'll be answering. Oh, let's go there now. Or Mark. So um, I'm going to have you call it in the air. Heads. You said heads? Mm -hmm. It's tails. <laughs> failure. <laughs> Mark. Failure can be brutal, ugly, and unpleasant, and tends to be more public than success. Therefore, isn't failure to be avoided at all costs? And if it is avoided, what fills in the gap to cause a person to persist and exceed, succeed? Uh, everyone, everyone experiences failure. I, I don't question that. And I don't question the fact that, that failure leads to success even. I'll go back to the very, the very first uh, illustration that I gave. You, you fall off the horse, you get back on the horse. Now, you do that enough and you become a proficient rider. 
Sure, the first time you rode the horse, he bucked you. The second time you rode the horse, you forgot to hold his head up, and he went, and he went forward, and you broke your arm. The third time you rode the horse, you, you, you held the reins too tight, and, he, and you went backwards instead of forward. Well, the point is, is that even though, even though the, that you have these horrific failures, it will be the success of riding that horse that will shape that person's life. He may even become a rodeo rider for all I know. But the point is, is that, is that it wasn't the failure that, it wasn't the, he forgot his failures. He forgot that, he forgot all of those failures. Success is what counted. Success is what made him. And, and not the failures. Thank you. Your rebuttal. Sure. Um, the question said that failure can be public, nasty, brutal. I argue that's the point. The reason that success has any value is, is because it's so nasty to fail. Think about sports. Those kind of movies that make us cry, like the you know, American ice hockey team, the reason the success has value is because we imagine the underdog and what they go under. If there was no nastiness or brutality to failure, then we would never play the game at all. Do you know what they call a game that's too easy to succeed? They call it broken. Great. So we're going to go right back at you. What would you say to someone who has given up hope because of perceived failures overriding success in their lives? Do they know me? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are many times in my own life where I was that person. It, even in my current job, being denied a promotion. And not just being denied a promotion, but being told that you are failing and you may not be here very long. <laughs> So what do you do in that moment? And I think what I would tell that person is what I've told anyone I've worked with or mentored, which is number one, use this as a moment to test if the thing you want is really that thing. And two, recognize that there is a, there is a celebration in that failure. There's a celebration in that moment. Because if you succeed eventually, it's remembering that history that gives our success value. I think about people who've had privileged lives their whole time. So in my essay, I'm talking about a lack of dating or getting into Harvard, who have all of those things, but they feel suicidal. They feel worthless. Why? Because they didn't have the realization of their own abilities. They didn't have the resistance that failure gives them. Think about celebrities, celebrities who kill themselves, celebrities who just go completely under ruin, and they're like, I only had one hit. And I'm here thinking, give me one hit. I want to be a one-hit wonder. They don't recognize their own successes because it came too easily. Same question. What would you say to someone who has given up hope because of perceived failures overriding success in their lives? You know, I, I, was, a, uh, I was a coach for 30 years. And, and, uh, I, and of course, every person on your team is not successful. And some of them feel very uh, as failures. Uh, it can happen in I've coached basketball and and uh, track and field mostly, and uh, and it's true that that people become obsessed with not winning, with not becoming what they wanted to be, uh, whether it was weightlifting or or running or or basketball or volleyball or or softball. Uh, and and my my answer for that is is that keep you keep striving for success and it'll come to you, but you have to pursue it. And and by nature, most of those people did exactly that. I had one girl on a basketball team, for example, who was uh, who was absolutely horrible, and and she went to summer camps at ODU, and. Uh, by the third year I had that girl, she was, she was my center, and she was the best person on the team. And she did that because she searched success, and that she got over her failures, even though she thought she was a failure at that time. And again, it comes right back down to success is the pursuit. It is not, it is not, the, it is not failure. And closing comments. You'll each have two minutes for your closing comments, and we're going to start with Mark. Okay. I think we need to go back to the original question, which plays a, a larger role in shaping your life. And my answer is success. It is not failure. Again, again, 
success is natural. It is, a, it is a natural instinct to want to do better, to find success, to go after success. Failure is not. In fact, in, fact, in most cases, you avoid failure at all costs. Some people more than others, and of course, that's, that's, that's one of the risks that you take. For example, in a, uh, if you're learning a foreign language, for example, and I think that's a good example, if you're learning a foreign, foreign language, you're going to make a 10,000 mistakes. I mean, you'll make mistake after mistake after mistake. But if you're a risk taker, in other words, you accept your mistakes. You don't dwell on your mistakes, you just accept them. You'll forget those 10,000 mistakes once you're fluent. When you're fluent in the language, then the mistakes didn't matter anymore. They, don't, they didn't matter anymore because now you're fluent, you speak in the language, you do what you're supposed to be doing in the language, and, and you know the language. Yes, you're a risk taker, and some people are more so than others. And of course, anyone in here that, that speaks a foreign language, you understand what I'm talking about, that, that you've gone, quote, the extra mile uh, to become proficient at, the, at, at that language. But the point is, is that you became proficient at that language and, because, because, and, and it will shape your life. And, and the point is, is that it's the success of it that shaped your life, not, not the failure. Thank you, Mark, for your closing comments. Anthony, closing comments. I agree with Mark about the value of success in terms of how is our natural instinct. But my thesis throughout tonight has been these are sometimes instincts that need to be challenged. We want to run away from failure. We want to block it out of our minds, and I would hope that we don't. When we think about the end of our lives, we don't think about how much money we made. We don't think about you know, how, you know, how cool was I in high school. We don't think about the things that came easy. If you've ever played a Nintendo game in the 1980s, you probably know what I'm talking about here. Games don't say game over anymore. That's a big problem. Why? Because it's no longer fun. Because you don't know what it's like to lose every five seconds. The value of our lives is in the challenges that we face and the ability to be the next person that we never thought we could be. If this topic was true, that success would play the larger role, right, then we would get participation trophies for every competition. We wouldn't have only four finalists on this stage, we'd have every single person on this stage. And the reason we don't do that is because we can't distinguish our lives. We can't make ourselves unique without the ability to recognize how fear can shape us. It can scare us, it can destroy us, or it can make our day. The freedom to choose where it directs you is how we define our lives, not just now, not just when we're happy, not just when we recognize a goal, but also at the end of our lives. When we see what we've accomplished, not just because they're accomplishments, but because what it took to get there. And that was the resistance and the pain and the brutality of failure, not success. Um, okay, audience, I sure would not want to be in your shoes, but it is now time to cast your vote using the ballots in the back of your program. So after having heard the arguments tonight, it is your turn to decide whether success or failure has a larger role in shaping one's life. It is up to you to decide which of these two debaters is America's greatest thinker. The suspense is almost too much to handle. So Boy Scouts, hey, can we have a round of applause for our Boy Scouts collecting all of the ballots? Thank you. Those Boy Scouts are something, okay, so aren't they? They've tallied up all the votes. Now, let's go back to the stage. Join us again on stage, Mark Bland, Rudy San Miguel, Tanya Abari, and Anthony Barry Hill. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, we have Alice with the awards. So we're gonna start by awarding our bronze medals to the uh, first round and second round contestants, Rudy San Miguel and Tanya Abari. Let's give them a round of applause for their bronze medals. So we're going to announce the gold medalist. Let's have a huge round of applause for the winner of this year's 2018 Great American Think Off, Anthony Barry Hill. <laughs> Woo! Failure wins! 
and a round of applause for Mark. Congratulations, and we'll see you at the Cultural Center. How do you feel? I don't f I, I... <laughs> you know, Vince, Vince Lombardi said it the best way. Winning, winning isn't everything. It's, it's the only thing. So I, I don't like second place, period. <laughs> but... Well, you got pretty far, man. You got all the way to the end. Yes. You got all the way to the final round. You put up a good fight. Not good enough. <laughs> I feel fantastic. Um, I had tons of fun. It was so much fun. You told me in New Orleans that you didn't think you were going to make it to the final round. No, I didn't. Yeah, I, and that's true. And you didn't. <laughs> I did not. That's absolutely true. Yeah. How do you think it went tonight? I think it went well. You know, we're all winners, and I think that's the important thing. Uh, we. This was a great experience for me, and I feel like I did hold my own <laughs> against Anthony, but he came out the victor, and... He was great, and he, he brought it home for, for the failure. <laughs> but you're not disappointed that you didn't get to go to the final round? No, absolutely not. Why would I be disappointed? I'm here. You may see me in two years, and I might be back on that stage with that gold medal. <laughs> Do you think your mommy did a good job? Yeah. Has anyone ever told you that you're just the best? Uh, yeah, my mommy's the best, too. I think everyone wants to be heard. And I think we're in a situation where people are blowing up on Twitter and social media and ever other, everywhere else because no one, they don't have an audience. So I think debate matters and substantive debate matters because it's the only opportunity that people can actually figure out what they're thinking and actually be able to tell other people what they're thinking. So in my own life, living in the lower ninth ward, no one heard me. And debate gave me the opportunity to have time to say, this is what I think, and you have to listen it, and you have to take it seriously.